Well, right there on my screen, it says you're live. I hope it means that I'm alive. Hey guys. Hello to team healthy. Glad to have you here with me. And uh, I'm going to give a couple of minutes for folks to jump in. I, I came in about a minute or so early. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got my buddies here on the, uh, the live chat off to the side. Noel, I think that uh, if I recall correctly, you had a job that's kind of taking you away from us on the live part. So I'm glad to have you with us in uh, Oklahoma City and UK and Illinois. All right. And uh, those of you who are jumping in, um, we have our <laughs> we have our Australia contingency that uh, that comes in at three o'clock in the morning or whatever it is there. And uh, we, we give them double gold stars. Um well, we have our Thanksgiving week here in the United States. I know some of you are, are watching from uh, other parts of the globe, uh, and this is a time where things kind of slow down and we pull back and reflect. Uh, so let me go ahead and say right up front, I, I am so, I, I, I really mean this when I say it, I'm so pleased to have Team Healthy here. Uh, it, uh, Laura and I started this about three and a half years ago, and it's just been such a, a, a wonder uh, to see how it's built over the course of time. And I, I'm, I just so am, I'm so honored to be a part of your journey with you. And so this, there's Ontario, uh, Savannah, Georgia, Scotland, uh, another one from UK. It, it's, it's such an honor uh, to be a part of your growth with you. And, and uh, I, I know that I've studied this topic uh, for many decades now, over four decades. And I'm hoping to share some of my thoughts with you. I'm a human being. And so I have uh, personal uh, issues that I can draw upon as well, or experiences, I should say, that I can draw upon as well. And I know that you all bring a lot to the uh, table here. So just know I'm so pleased that we're all in this together and we're all headed, hopefully, in the same direction. Okay, now I'm going to be talking about how narcissism shows up in many different ways based on the questions that you've sent. Those of you who are new know that you can either uh, put your question right here on the comments uh, chat room there on the side. If, if you're look, watching live, if you're watching the tape, put it uh, below the video and I'll pick up on it. I can't do all the questions that come in because there are too many. Uh, but here's some questions that have come in through this week. And I'm going to start with uh, this one right off the bat. And this is a this is a question about boundaries, okay? And here we are, at least in America, we're in our uh, holiday time. And is this not a time when we need to have a, a good understanding of boundaries? Uh, the, the question is, why do narcissists react so badly when boundaries are placed and they refuse to accept them? Now, first of all, I just want you to pause and think, how many of you have made an attempt, whether it's yesterday or this morning or eight years ago, to establish your boundaries with a narcissist? And that person said, hey, great point. <laughs> Tends not to happen. Uh, let's keep in mind what we're talking about when we refer to having relationship boundaries. And um, many times we, uh, we think of it in terms of keeping people out. And that's not what I really am referring to when I refer to boundaries. What I'm referring to is your definition of who you are. Uh, you have your parameters set regarding what you believe is wise and reasonable and decent in the way that you engage with people. And you want to stay inside that definition. Those become your boundaries. Uh, this is my property line. This is who I am. This is what I stand for. Now, when you uh, engage with a narcissist, they're schemers. They're manipulators, they're entitled, and they, they think, and, and it's so crazy to think this way, but they think, well, the world is going to be a lot better off if they'll just do what I tell them to do. They're highly controlling and entitled and all the rest. And so if you let it be known, well, but I already have a definition of who I am, and I don't require you to tell me what that means. Now, as a, as a healthy person, speaking personally, it's like, I'm always open to input. If that's something that might make me a better person, sure, I'll listen. And if there's something that I need to learn about other people as we coordinate, I, I'm willing to do that. But but the controller, the, the, uh, the narcissist is like, no, just let me do your thinking for you. And this explains why they're so willing to offer you advice that you didn't ask for. They're very easily critical toward you. It's like, you're not on my agenda. What's wrong with you now? Uh, they have a very thin skin reaction if you say something that doesn't go according. So when you ask, why do they not 
uh, respond well when you said boundaries is because you're not playing by the rule book, meaning their rule book. Their rule book says, I'm uh, rule number one is I make all the decisions. Rule number two, always remember to rule number one. That's, that's how they operate. And you're just attempting to apply normalcy, reasonableness, and it, little things like this that we're talking about is just another illustration. There's so many ways that narcissism shows up and they're very unhealthy and very illogical kind of individuals. Somewhere in the near future, I've already recorded it, um, but I'm going to have a, a video about the, the absurdity, uh, the obliviousness that they operate with. And this would be an illustration of that. But basically, the reason they don't like your boundaries is because it's your way of saying you're not in charge of me. And that's not that's, you know. That's not a bad thing at all to say. And, and that for them, that they can't celebrate your uniqueness. Your the diversity that you represent scares them. Uh, they don't know what to do with you. Now, another one, and this takes it a little bit uh, further than just stepping over boundaries. Uh, they ask, this person asked, well, why do abusive people with narcissistic traits want to destroy the lives of those that they were supposed to love and cherish, especially in divorce and financial settlements. And then they walk away with no shame. Now, uh, well, when she says that they're supposed to love and cherish, I'm making the assumption this person is uh, drawing upon the wedding vows. You know, I'm going to love, honor, and cherish, you know, that. And so they they give that that promise, that declaration. It's And, and yet, whenever things don't go their way, rather than sitting down and kind of like with that uh, a person that just doesn't respect your boundaries, rather than sitting down and saying, well, let's talk about it and let's see if we can find a meeting of the minds. Narcissists have an underdeveloped conscience. They, they claim to have a sense of right and wrong. And some of them may have a very moralistic or authoritarian or uh, some sort of a, a better than thou attitude that they project. But really, when it comes down to it, their conscience is not that strong. Uh, they are tied down by black and white thinking. Their strategy for engaging with people is to elevate their own fragile egos by diminishing you. And when you think about that just a little bit, it's like, that doesn't work. You know, the, the crazy thing is when I have spoken with people with this, this strong narcissistic bent, inevitably I find that they had in their background people who were overbearing and bossy and, uh, uh, you know, very uh, pushy in their opinions. Sometimes that narcissist was that person's uh, golden child or flying monkey. Many times that narcissist was on the receiving end of the condescension of other individuals. But instead of them growing up thinking, you know, looking back, that, that wasn't a very good strategy. And that wasn't a, a wise way for me to uh, come up uh, because basically the uh, uh, anything that has to do with abuse and, and harshness means that uh, they've been exposed to lots of shame and condescension. You'd like to think that they could look back and say, I, I can do better than that. Instead, many narcissists with their all or nothing black and white thinking have uh, virtually no true introspective skills. And so they think, well, the way that I win is to be every bit as condescending towards others as others have proved to be towards me and the rest of the world. And then if I can be the same way, I win. And so uh, here you are, you were in a marriage and they promised to love and honor. What they didn't say was, as long as you fit my mold. They forgot to put that, uh, that segment in. And so they have an underdeveloped conscience. They have a strategy that says, uh, because uh, of my fragile ego, which they won't admit, uh, I build myself at other people's expense. And, and the crazy thing is this is such a highly predictable pattern. Uh, I mean, how many people have I talked about who have this same kind of thing? And so I'm sorry that you had to go through this in a marriage with somebody who made that vow and promise with you and I'll just say it straight up, but then they proved to be a bald faced liar. And that's the way they are. Truth is expedient to a narcissist. 
we have what uh, what we refer to as alternate reality. They they operate with uh, their own alternate reality. In other words, they make things up as they go along. And uh, it, it happens in marriage. It happens in businesses or social settings or um, you know uh, organizations. Uh, they can set themselves up up front to look like a nice person, but over time, it's like ooh. There's a whole lot of scheming going on and a whole lot of entitlement going on that you didn't reveal right up front. And that's the way it works. Okay. Uh, next question. The, this person says, Dr. C, it would be interesting to hear you talk about levels of narcissism. Uh, it's not all or nothing with people, right? So how do we discern the line between those who are self-centered, but you know, well, actually, I, I've mentioned this before, but it's been a while since we've talked about this on the live feed, so it bears repeating. Narcissism, in my estimation, and uh, the estimation of many people in my profession, is in fact a pattern on a spectrum. We have what we refer to as the narcissistic personality disorder, or one of my heroes in the, the theoretical realm was er Eric Fromm. Uh, F-R-O-M-M, -M, and uh, he's the, uh, the theoretician that uh, that came up with the uh, term malignant narcissism. About 5% or so of the population, some will say three, some will say six, but around 5% of the population are malignant narcissists. They're way down there on that far end of the spectrum. Uh, high control, very self-centered, uh, entitlement, uh, need for superiority, uh, just a, a willingness to crush people. And so why don't we just say that top uh, 5% uh, is the worst and it's kind of you don't want to deal with. Well, what about the 95% the uh, in front of that? Well, there are people who might be strongly narcissistic, but uh, and I know this isn't uh, technical, but we can say, but they're at the 80% level very strong. Some people are way down at the 40% level. It's like, well, they, they have some selfishness and controlling tendencies, but they are able to check themselves. Um, the, the demarcation point that I have is that, but first of all, there's nobody that's down on the 0% level. We all have this selfishness and controlling nature and entitlement that shows up in some form or another, uh, unless maybe your mother Teresa. Uh, but, uh, 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 if, if somebody is at, let's say about the 20%, 25% level, there are times when their selfishness does show up or they may say something that they go back and say, I, I didn't really handle that, but then they correct themselves pretty quickly. Then to me, that implies, okay, if, by and large, you have a good handle on it. I don't think any of us is going to be so ideal that we don't have some elements uh, of that on the inside. Way early on when I started the channel, I did a, a video called uh, The Hidden Narcissism Inside Normal People. And that might be an interesting one for you to look into. So we all can have some. Healthy people, though, see it. And they have uh, their own self-awareness. They acknowledge it and they, they curtail it. Now, the, the, the further down you go where, well, it just creeps in 30% of the time, 50% of the time, and 50 is kind of where I do my demarcation. In other words, uh, in moments where it really counts, more often than not, they'll go more towards the selfish and the demanding and the defensive uh, than they do the healthy. Uh, in fact, this, this morning we had a, a video that came up about being argumentative, and uh, it, it's in conflict that you really do see where a person is on the scale of narcissism, conflict reveals character. And so watch how people uh, engage you know, when they uh, have moments of disagreement or disappointment with others. And then you'll be able to see probably uh, the level of narcissism or lack of that might be there. If there's conflict and you show yourself to be someone that says, hey, let's talk about it. Let's think it through. I know you have some things that are a major concern, just as I do. Let's see if we can be adult by, about this. Uh, well, that's to me, that's probably an indicator that that person is way down on the low end, uh, the low level. Uh, when a person says, I don't want to talk about it. I just want to tell you. Or they go into this stubborn denial or uh, they go into the stonewalling and they hold you in contempt and they do the silent treatment. All of that's just petty. And, and frankly, it's very childlike. You, you, they, they, they just drop any sense of reason and raw emotion uh, runs with them. That's when you know that you're dealing with somebody that, that's uh, moving further down that, uh, that uh, spectrum towards the, the unhealthy form of narcissism. And so if you will, I, I, the way I like to 
describe it is there is kind of a percentage, if you will, that you can apply to this. And, and that's how you can determine. OK. Um, in, in fact, um, let's see, there was another one. Yeah. Well, in fact, here, here it is right here. Uh, uh, oh, uh, no, this I had made a note to myself. Uh, how do you know if a person is uh, how far down on the spectrum or not? Um, uh, I, I, what I put is uh, the three A's, awareness, accountability, and adjustments. If a person has a lot of self-awareness, if they make themselves accountable and they're willing to make true adjustments, then you know that they're on the low end. I, I just made that note to myself. Okay. All right. How about this next question? Do narcissists brag about who they know and what they have, or am I just taking it the wrong way? Let me ask another question. Um, are fish wet? Yeah, narcissists like to brag about who they know or what they have. Uh, you know, some may be a little close to the best and they, they won't reveal the fact that yeah, I've got a whole lot of things, but narcissists, they're, they're full of themselves. And so in one form or another, they're going to reveal that, well, I have a pretty high opinion of me. And, uh, and it can come in the form of overt bragging, like, uh, hey, did you know about this time when I did this, or I have this, and th look, look how cool my car is, or uh, I went on that trip to Tahiti, and nobody else gets to do that except me. I mean, th sometimes they'll be very overt in their braggadociousness. Other times their bragging comes in kind of a disguised way where there might be a, a type of put down, you know, like, well, that person over there, they, they really think they know a lot, but they don't. The implication is I do. Uh, or uh, other people have opinions, but mm, they're, they're not nearly as, as enlightened as, well, my opinion. And so the bragging might be a little bit more oblique in that kind of way, but it's there. Uh, narcissists have an insatiable need to be a somebody. They have an insatiable need for you to walk away thinking, wow, that person's impressive, or that's, that's a force to be reckoned with. And, and so they're going to communicate their attitude of superiority in many different ways. They're, they're in constant compensation mode. Don't be fooled by it. They're compensating for their deeper fears of being inadequate. Uh, and so as part of that compensation, they brag or they put other people down as a part of elevating themselves. Uh, that's, that is a constant when we're dealing with narcissists. Okay. I just see somebody put the word <laughs> humble bragging. Okay. That, and that's, that's a whole other thing. Uh, for example, it might be that uh, uh, you may say, uh, l let's just say today, today's the day before Thanksgiving. And, and you, uh, somebody says, Hey, would you be able to do this, that, and the other? And they might say, well, uh, I'm preparing to, uh, to, to do this food drive for these people. I actually do this every year and, and I'm, I'm kind of the lead person and they go a little bit too far in, uh, talking about how, well, I'm really a special person and it, it doesn't mean that you can't reveal those things. Uh, but sometimes they do the humble bragging too, where they just get, give a little bit too much attention. Like <laughs> I'm, I'm really somebody special here. And so beware of that as well. Okay. Okay, this, this next one's an interesting one, okay? Um, uh, Dr. C, we would like your opinion about narcissism pandemic. Is it real in your uh, point of view? Um, and the answer is yes. Um, I, I, in other words, is there a pandemic of narcissism? Is it just growing and expanding? And in my opinion, the answer is yes. Uh, another, uh, going back to Eric Fromm, uh, he talks about how uh, you, you can determine a lot about narcissism, not just by looking at someone's family of origin, although that, of course, is important, but also the social milieu that you grew up in. He would, uh, Eric Fromm was known as a social psychologist, that you can, uh, uh, many uh, ingredients inside the societal norms can also feed uh, narcissism. And I, I was born in the 1950s, uh, 1954. Uh, for those of you who are taking count, you can do the math and figure out how old I am. Uh, no secret there. It was different in the 1950s and it was different in the 1960s. I, I, I actually grew up saying stuff like, yes, ma'am. No, sir. I didn't say no, sir, too much. I usually said yes, sir, a lot. But, you know, you, you, you opened the door for someone else and you were taught manners and you sat down at the table and, uh, and you had a, a family dinner 
And it, it was a simpler time. And I'm not saying that we were ideal back then because we had our, our points, but, th but there was more of a courtesy that was a part of our social milieu back in the fifties and sixties. And then as each year has gone by, we can, or excuse me, each decade has gone by, we can see that some of that's been breaking down. And this, uh, uh, I need to express me, which, which is fine, became so much of a dominant force that I think it has been exaggerated. And we have a lot of people now who, uh, you, when was the last time you, you heard a kid say, uh, thank you, or yes, sir, or yes, ma'am. And I, I, I um, it, this is a funny story. I have a niece who's now, or grandniece, who's now, I, I guess, Hannah's up. Uh, 15. She was about three. And at the time we had a swimming pool in our backyard and, and I asked her something and uh, she looked at me and said, um, yes, ma'am. And, and I looked at my niece, her mother, and, I, and she said, well, we don't have the ma'am and sir part down. Although well, I'm impressed that she said yes, ma'am to me, because she was learning very early on that you need to be courteous. And it, it seemed out of place, which is kind of sad. And, and she, by the way, she and her, uh, her younger sister's 13 are still that way. Um, unfortunately, there's more and more of a me, me, me mentality, instant gratification. The internet, I think, has uh, uh, played a, a large role in something like that. And so is there a pandemic? Is there something that's growing worldwide? I, I think the answer is yes. There's more of a sense of gimme, gimme, gimme. And, uh, and as a result, uh, when somebody like uh, a parent or uh, let's say a, a person at work or social says, hey, let's rein this in, uh, the, 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 these days, the natural response is you're stepping on my rights. And it's like, no, I'm just asking that we be responsible with each other. It's like, yeah, who cares about that? So I do think there's some of that going on. Uh, I have a sneaking suspicion that some of you would agree. I'm mean, some of you as old as I am. So you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, this next one, Dr. Carter, how do you know if someone is getting to know you in a healthy way? versus gaining information. In other words, data gathering is the way I put it. And this person goes on to say, I was raised by a narcissistic fa a father and married a narcissist. He was so friendly and seemingly caring, but it changed immediately after marriage. After 18 and a half years, I asked him to leave and his true colors became even more clear. But even with therapy, I'm not sure how to discern genuine interest or you being mined for information? That's a really uh, intriguing question because I know that so many of you have that same one. Um, how do I know if somebody shows an interest that it's the real deal or not? Um, and I, I think it was uh, very recent. I did one about being duped and I've got some other uh, issues or uh, videos coming up about that and narcissists being schemers. Part of narcissism, in fact, this is in the uh, the official definition of it, is they have the ability to make good first impressions. And so they can come across as pleasant and friendly and capable and competent. And it's not like they're just kind of falling all over themselves, also, although some of them, they just uh, they don't leave a whole lot to the imagination. But much of the problem of narcissism is its hidden nature in the upfront sense. And so uh, it, it's the old, um, uh, the, the ultimate um, uh, form of manipulation they have is their uh, capacity for counterfeiting. So the question is, how do you know that you're not just being played with a data gatherer uh, versus them really wanting to know you? At first, it, it requires time. And sometimes uh, it, it, the narcissism, I've had people say, well, it, it didn't really come out for several years and then it showed up. Um, but one huge thing that I watch for that tells me if a person is probably of a low narcissistic bent is when they ask me about uh, who I am, it's not just fact gathering. What did you do this weekend? Or uh, what did your sister say about this? You know, things like that. But healthy individuals want to know your essence. And, and typically they make comments about your essence. Essence uh, means your being, your inner spirit, your inner sense of, of uh, you know, identity. For example, uh, let's suppose that I say something like, um, 
you know, I'm not going to see my sister for the holidays. I, I, I have a sister. I, I probably will see her though, over the holidays. But let, let's say, well, I'm not going to see my sister over the holidays. And someone may pick up and say, you know, I can tell that that's, uh, that uh, is something that uh, you're frustrated by. And if I say, well, uh, we have different uh, extended family obligations and so it's not going to happen, but uh, we, uh, we're, we're going to catch up with each other sometime afterward. Uh, they'll, they'll go into that space and it's like, well, tell me about your sister and, and uh, what, what is the, uh, the nature of your relationship? And they want to know you at, the, at a deeper level and, and the meaning of that relationship. And, and they can honestly have a genuineness about the way that they engage with you. They pick up on the nuances about who you are and what you feel and what your desires and goals are. Or if you have a hurt or if you have a, a, a joy, they're able to share in that in a full way. And then typically they'll share of a similar nature in reverse about who they are. Now, I'm not going to say that it's a foolproof kind of thing, because sometimes narcissists in their disguise can, can try to show themselves as that, but typically most don't. Uh, they don't like to go down into that deeper level of exploration. So watch and see if they're interested in not just what you do and what you believe and what your uh, experiences are, but uh, watch and see if they actually appreciate the essence of who you are and they like to go into that space with you and park there for a while. I, I, I typically like that when I hear it from somebody. Okay. Uh, another question. This one said, and, and this, this one's a really interesting one. I wonder how siblings that grew up in the same home with the same parents become so different. My parents were both narcissists. They've passed. Uh, I found out about narcissistic abuse after my mother passed. I believe my two sisters uh, uh, are narcissists, and I've been no contact with them since two years after my mother died, which was about 14 years ago. So in other words, she hadn't seen her sisters in about 12 years. How the heck did I not turn into a narcissist? I realized what real love was when I had my son. Okay, that last sentence, I wanted to make sure I got that in. I realized what real love is. Um, I, I did a video a while back called A New Way to Define Narcissism, and that new way is narcissism is defined by the absence of love. Many people have grown up where love was just, a word, but it, it didn't really have the, the meaning that it needs to. Narcissists do not know how to love. They don't know how to make attachments. And, you know, um, it's, it's, it's interesting. And I, I had a professor way back in graduate school who said, uh, no two people ever grew up in the same family. And, and that's, that's important for you to realize. Um, if you're, let's say the middle of three uh, children, well, you've always had an older sibling and a younger sibling. That older sibling has never had an older sibling. They only had two younger ones, or that younger sibling has never had uh, someone younger. They've only had two older. And, and we each view the family from different vantage points. We each have different experiences uh, inside the same family. And so even though we have some similarities, then uh, they're not all exactly the same. In addition, each sibling can have different exposures to teachers or coaches or outside influences or, you know, the, the, the mother of a friend or the, the kind of people that they hang out with and different influences come along. And so some people can have the advantage of having uh, uh, encountered people who say, hey, we can do better than that uh, selfish stuff that might be on the inside of your family. And it, it, it makes an imprint. Uh, I, I remember one uh, woman talking with me, this is a while back, who as a teenager, her mother was friends with a lady who would come over to their house fairly often. And the mother was a uh, cold and uncaring. Um, but she said, you know, every single time that friend came over, she was so warm and engaging. And she talked with me in, in a very uh, meaningful, at least to me, ways at age 14 uh, or 15. And uh, she just got inside my head. Well, that's wonderful. And so you ask the question, how is it that she, this, this one uh, person didn't become narcissistic, but the other did. It's like, well, actually, when you break it down, there typically are some 
other or differing kinds of experiences, even though you grew up in the same family, you didn't have the exact same dynamics. And then in addition, even though you grew up in the same family, many times family members have different designations. You're the scapegoat. You're the golden child. You're the one, what was your name? <laughs> we forget about you. You're the lost child. I mean, so we each have different uh, experiences like that, which explains how when we uh, get beyond that, uh, then, uh, you know, different uh, uh, things begin to show up in the adult years. Okay. Um, the, 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 essence of the, the key is uh, I real when she says, I realized what real love was when I had my son. Uh, I'm hoping that uh, those of us here on team healthy, that we can look at and say, you know, I, I really do want to know uh, what the essence of love is. And I want to live into that and, and, you know, all the, the different meanings of what that is. Uh, by the way, uh, you, you've heard me talk about my uh, video courses. I, I'm working on one right now. It's called Ready, Set, Connect. And it'll probably come out sometime next spring. But uh, I'm going to be talking about the healthy ingredients and, and how to connect well and what you have to bring from the inside out. And it's possible for you to make those adjustments. Some people, even though they didn't have the greatest start, uh, they they uh, enter into their adult years and they figure it out. Okay. All right. Another question. Um, what do you call it when your narcissistic husband makes a statement that is vague or perhaps not logical? And then when I ask for clar clarification about what he means, he basically just repeats what he already said and then walks away. I've become aware of this as a tactic that he uses to try to get me to follow him around and pursue the issue, issue further. But if I do that, it inevitably ends up being a conversation where I get slammed with a bunch of condescending comments and he walks away with a smug look on his face. Now, by the way, that's called the gotcha game. Um, narcissist, going back to that thing about this, uh, that other person that said, I, I learned what real love is. Narcissists don't know what love is. And part of love is that you show a patience, you have an honor, uh, you're not a scoreboarder. Uh, you don't really turn conversations into competitions. Clearly your husband has no conception of love. Uh, instead, what he's saying is I'm accountable to no one. So in this lady's case, when she says, hey, we need to talk, and then he just gives these vague or repetitive or uh, non-answer answers and then expects you to keep on, it's like, wait a minute, I, I've been down that road too many times. I'm not biting from here on out. And so part of our emphasis on surviving narcissism channel is to, uh, to let it be known, I see it. Uh, I, I know what your tactics are. And every single time now that you throw those tactics in front of me, I'm going to remind myself I have choices and I can choose to jump in there and play your game with you, which is the following you around the house and saying, please, please, let's not have any disagreements. Or I can choose to say, if that's where you are, I'm pulling back. Uh, we have what we call the gray rock technique which is I, I'm just going to go bland and I'm going to accept, okay, we don't have a lot of depth and I'll just answer you in very simplistic kind of ways since you don't want to go any further than that. And, uh, and, uh, and then you just go from there for a narcissist to be open and being uh, you know, willing to talk with you about personal matters. They interpret that as giving up power. You would interpret that as coordinating. But it's like, no, they, they like to be in the power position, which is a part of their compensation for their fear of powerlessness. OK, now this next question kind of gives a little bit of a different kind of an angle. This person says, I've heard you say that narcissists don't like feeling vulnerable and don't like talking about themselves. I, actually, I don't know that I've ever said they don't like talking about themselves. What I, what I have said plenty is they don't like to talk about themselves in a uh, um, a penetrating kind of way or in a self-revealing way where they uh, go into that space of vulnerability. Uh, they, they can talk about themselves all day long, but not on that personal uh, level. My husband is always talking about himself to friends and families about personal things that are going on in his personal life. He's an open book and doesn't hesitate to talk about our marriage to anyone. Things that I don't think anyone else should know about uh, that should stay between him and me. And he'll tell lies about me to everyone, a smear campaign. Why does he feel the need to keep doing this and always wants all the attention on him? Now there's an, uh, there's a flaw in this person's, uh, uh, acknowledgement of what the husband's doing. She says he's an open book. And the answer is, Oh no, he's not. 
he wants to give the appearance that he's an open book, but he's a whiner and he's a victim. And, uh, and uh, uh, there's not openness. For example, if he's saying, yeah, my wife and I had an argument. Well, the open person would say, I, I really need to take a look at why I let myself get so worked up. And cause I, I don't like that about myself and I wish that I could do differently. I doubt that he's doing a whole lot of that. So when, uh, when you say he's an open book, no, he likes to talk about himself as the victim and it's part of him portraying his faults uh, persona. He's not open, he's closed, but in an open seeming kind of way. That's the counterfeit. And, and uh, it's, it's so important for you to realize that these, uh, when I say narcissism shows up in so many different ways, they can present themselves as being the most open person you ever met. In fact, sometimes they'll say, oh, you'll never meet anybody that's more open than me. And uh, when, when you hear that, it's like, okay, that's a red flag. Now, why do you have to tout that? Or I'm, I'm so trustworthy. It's like, why do you have to tell me that too? And so uh, let's just keep in mind his quote openness is nothing more than him drawing people into a complaint session and they can be good about creating that false front and, uh, and uh, the, the, the self self disclosure that he appears to be giving is nothing more than a ploy to receive sympathy or another word supply. Uh, he wants people to pat him on the back saying they're there. I'm so sorry that you have this. And then he walks off saying, I did it again. I win. And so I'm hoping that you can see it for what it's worth. And this openness is merely a deception. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see here. Let, let's make this the last one today. This person says, I'm struggling with the fact that I was the scapegoat child and never really knew it. I really believe that my mom loved me, but now at the age of 47, my friend has pointed out that my mom was a narcissist a covert narcissist. And she really did a smear campaign on me. And that if it wasn't bad enough that, but she was my abuser without my knowledge, I feel so dumb because I never saw it. Or maybe I did, but I denied the red flags. I'm not sure. I don't know how to move on. Uh, all I do these days is cry. And I hear you say, trust your gut, but I don't know how to do that. When I was so wrong about my mother, I can't seem to even trust myself. Yeah, and and here and this person is at age forty-seven. It's like I'm I'm just now unraveling this, and um, my mother just scapegoated me left and right. In other words, a lot of blame and a lot of harshness. Um, and uh, she was the one that caught all the the stuff that mom was projecting onto her. A lot of gaslighting. Sometimes you just don't know what you don't know. And it takes a lot of experience for uh, the other style of thinking and doing life to eventually show up. Now, this woman says she's 47. I, I tell folks, I used to say in my counseling office when I had my practice, uh, your best thinking doesn't even begin until you hit 40. Uh, sometimes you have a couple of decades inside your adult years before you begin knowing how to pull things together and interpret things in, in ways that you might have other, uh, done otherwise. Uh, and you separate yourself off from that, uh, that more dependent style and you become your own more adult, uh, middle-aged independent thinker. And so here she is at 47 and it's like, I don't know how to trust myself. By, by the way, uh, when I say trust your gut, I can almost guarantee that this woman had moments where mom was being harsh, and she thought to herself, I don't like the sound of this. Okay. That's your gut speaking. Or the mother was being demanding and she thought to herself, why would I fall in line with her when she's so bossy? That's your gut speaking. And so, uh, when I say trust your gut, it's like, listen to what your uncomfortable emotions are telling you. And I'm sure in her case, it's like, uh, she heard the message instead. Well, your emotions mean nothing to me. They're invalid. You're invalid. And so when you hear that over and over and over, uh, then you finally just collapse and say, okay, okay. But your gut is speaking. And so what I'm hoping is you can learn the meaning of things like anger. It's tied to your self-preservation 
or fear. That implies that the, you feel that there's an unsafeness there. And as you learn how to listen to what your emotions are telling you, uh, in fact, I had a, a video on that, uh, listening to the pain that uh, that uh, is involved or that's going on when you are with a narcissist or something to that effect. Uh, listen to what your pain is saying. And then if you need somebody, uh, in her case, uh, a therapist, uh, then I, I strongly encourage that you uh, take somebody up on that so they can help you uh, retranslate what you used to believe to be one way. And over time, you can learn how to, to have different kinds of interpretations. Uh, just because you're 47 years old doesn't mean that you're too late to the game or to the table. Uh, it just means, okay, I've got a lot of experience to draw from and I can learn new things. Uh, today is the first day to the rest of my life and I am going to learn how to listen to myself a lot better. So, okay, we're down on time here today. Uh, here at the Carter house, we got a little uh, Thanksgiving preparation. I think my wife's going to send me to the grocery store for some stuff. You know how that works. Uh, I, I, I'm glad to do it. Now we're going to be doing some uh, cooking. Uh, here in the U.S., we have our Thanksgiving tomorrow. I want to say I'm thankful to you, Team Healthy, for who you are and for, like I say, letting me be in a part of your journey with you. I hope you have a good, meaningful weekend. Those of you who are outside of the U.S., I hope that you have a, a good time uh, uh, where you are. We're coming up on the holiday seasons, and it's a, it's a time for us to have a reflection about what we know to be wise and best in those boundaries we've been talking about today. So stay strong. Stay with Team Healthy. Uh, we're all trying to move in the same direction. So uh, next week is the beginning of December. I'll see you then. And uh, uh, between now and then, I hope that uh, things go well for you. And again, uh, thanks for letting me be on your journey with you. See you next time. Bye.